Arab-Israeli conflict is something that I started to study really not to become a speaker or an educator on it at all. I, I really just wanted to understand for myself as best I could what was going on. Um, little did I know when I began that this was a far more complex subject than I had at first thought. And as somebody, I had a teacher once who told me, you, you don't take something complex and try and simplify it and expect that that will actually make it less confusing for people. It actually does the opposite. And so oftentimes you hear speakers on this topic basically say, well, we can sum this up very simply as X, Y, or Z. Uh, my experience is that's not the case. Yours may be different, um, which is fine, but my experience is uh, actually quite different. It is a, um, I find, fascinating topic, personally, uh, not just for, uh, from a religious perspective, but from a historical perspective, an ideological perspective, a political perspective. I, I find it, um, uh, uh, for me, as a, as a student, a work in progress. Um, every time I think I've got a handle on something, I find more information that just enlightens me in, in another area. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a bit of a distillation of what is tens of thousands of hours of research. And one of the things I want to try and do today, one of the takeaways that I, I hope you'll leave with, uh, is that in each of the three areas I'm going to speak about, the, the historical context, the political context and the legal context, that there are really two sides to the story. I know that um, Jewish people, and just like the, uh, the Palestinian people, are very passionate <laughs> for obvious reasons, because there's a lot at stake here. It speaks to the core issues, um, the, the things that go to the core of people's belief systems. And I, I want to ask you, if you can, to just try and suspend uh, some of that emotion for today, because we're going to take, as you can see, hopefully a critical thinking approach. And y usually um, in issues this complex, there is always more than one side, and things are often more complicated than they seem at the outset. Okay, so with that, let's begin. There's a Palestinian, uh, was a Palestinian jurist by the name of Henry Catan, who also uh, was on the, one of the representatives of the Arab High Committee in the meetings that happened at the UN in 1947. He wrote a number of books. And among some of his statements in the early part of his book, he, he starts his whole introduction to uh, Palestine and international law with some statements about history. And just to sum up, because there's a lot in his claims, uh, just to sum it up in a sentence or two, basically he makes the point that um, the ancient Israelites were not the first inhabitants in, the, uh, in what he calls Canaan, right? Canaan, right? The Canaanites were. And, non and when they did come, they basically invaded a population that was already there. And even once they had invaded, that their tenure there was quite short. I mean, they were only, let's say, sovereign or in control of that territory for, let's say, the total of, uh, I, I don't know what his, his math is, but let's say a century or two all total. And so it was a really brief period of history. This, his view is not just his view, it's also the general view of the Palestinian Authority and their leadership, their politicians, their education system. The idea, I'm sure you've heard it before, especially of late, that the Palestinian people are the indigenous population in this territory of Canaan or Palestine or Israel. And the ancient Israelites, even though they did have a presence there, their their time there was not like Jewish history says it was, like it didn't cover this, the, say, the amount of time that Jewish history claims it did. And, and once it was over, that, that we, or, or the Jewish people, um, today are not, are not even necessarily connected to those ancient Israelites. This, this is the general claim, okay? So what is uh, the claims of of Jewish history. 
right? Because there are two stories, right? Two narratives. So the Jewish people's narrative is they, they, we, the Jewish people, start our story um, with the patriarchs. And then, you know, we consider the ancient Israelites are the descendants of, we know the name of, everybody here knows the name Israel, according to Jewish theology and Jewish history, comes from Jacob, who was given the name Israel. His sons were then called the children of Israel. Their descendants became the 12 tribes. And according to our story, the 12 tribes then settled uh, the land of Israel um, after their exodus from Egypt. Everybody's familiar with the, with the broad brushstrokes, correct? Okay, so according to Jewish history, um, this is where the, the nation of Israel sort of begins their story in the land of Israel. And then it continues through the periods of King David and Solomon uh, on through the Greek and Roman eras. And then sh shortly like thereafter, after the last uh, rebellion against the Romans in the uh, beginning of the second century of the common area, there is a mass dispersion. And the population of the Jewish people there, uh, would maybe they'd be called the Judeans at the time since it was the Roman province of Judea, were now uh, quite small. And then as Islam came on the world scene a few centuries later in the 7th century, uh, within a few centuries there was an Arab Muslim majority there and it has remained so up until the 20th century when the political enterprise of Zionism then took over, okay? So um, there is obviously uh, some truth to, to the fact, and we all know, that something really remarkable in history happened. It's not comparable to any other situation where a people, after a couple of millennia, had an opportunity that presented and decided to, because basically they, they, they en masse, move back to an area that they felt like was their homeland, right? There is no other comparable story in human history. Um, and it is a fact that when that time, that, that era began in the 20th century, um, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, Palestine as it was called then, um, were a minority, a significant minority in that particular territory. Uh, we're all familiar with with the, the broad brush strokes. What's different about the two narratives, the one I started with, Henry Catan's narrative, or the narrative of the Palestinian people, and the Jewish people's narrative, is this claim of an ancient connection of in, indigeneity, uh, if you will. And what we have then, in terms of history, is these two competing historical claims. And the question, you know, is, all right, I mean, can they both be reconciled? Is there evidence that ends up supporting one over the other? So which part, let's, let's talk just about the history, and then we're going to move into the contemporary uh, conversation in the 20th century. So the part about Catan's uh, historical introduction in his book that's true is according to Jewish history, I, I mean, it would agree with what he says, that there, when, the, when the Jewish people uh, showed up to conquer the land of Israel, there were Canaanites there, and other peoples as well, Moabites, Hittites, Amorites, Jebusites, the list goes on and on. So that part is in no way contradictory to Jewish history and theology. The part that is different is the idea that there is a Jewish dominion there. And of course, I'm not, I'm not speaking now about, about a biblical perspective here because um, you know, we, we understand that if we're taking the Bible as an authority, if people are taking the Bible as authority, then most of what I'm saying is really, it's not relevant because according to a biblical worldview, uh, the Jewish people believe that the land belongs to them through the patriarchs, through the inheritance, to the, to, through Jacob, and then through his sons, and then his descendants, which Jewish people believe they are, right? That's, that's the Jewish story. 
Um, what I'm describing now are more the facts of when you go extra biblical, outside the Bible, what history will also support. And as we move into Greek and Roman history and through Babylonian and Assyrian uh, arc epigraphic material, um, what's different about the narrative of Catan and Jewish history is that there is a Jewish presence continual in, the, in, in that territory for millennia. And not only that, but the challenge with the, with the Palestinian Arab claim is that there is a big gap. Even, one can make a, a, a claim, an assertion, that they are the indigenous population. The question is, is then, what happens then if you say, all right, there's this ancient people called the Palestinians back 3,000 years ago, and then you fast forward to the 20th century with, with people who identify as Palestinians. The question is now, where's the information in between? How do you then, I mean, someone can make that claim, but where, is, where are the links? Where's the chain that validates the, the statement, the assertion? And what's different about the, the Jewish historical narrative is there are, you know, through hundreds of generations, through a millennia of time, uh, a list of names of Jewish leaders. Uh, we have their writings, we have their sayings, we have their statements up through the Talmudic era. In almost every century uh, from, let's say, biblical era, era right up till today. And so it's a, it's, it's a little bit more of a challenging claim if, you're, if somebody's going to claim indigenousness, that's even a word, right, without filling in gaps. And, and that's really when you compare those two historical claims, it ends up becoming challenging for somebody from the outside to put them at equal weight. Does that make sense? Okay, because uh, according to Jewish history, I mean, there's, there's fill, Right? There's, there's a chain of transmission, there's a chain of tradition that goes from 1300 before the common, well, before that, let's say 1900 before the common era, right up until today, I'm well over 3,000 years, closer to 4,000 years. Okay, so we have these competing historical claims. And what I was just trying to do there is show you that, you know, one of the things when, when I was exploring this, that I tried not to take for granted Whatever it was emotionally that I had been taught or that I wanted to believe, I really just wanted to understand for myself what evidence exists to support each of these claims, right? If I really wanted to understand what, was, what they were resting on for myself, okay? Okay. So now fast forward. There really um, wasn't a big debate that I'm aware of in the public arena like there is today about whose history is true. The things that I just summarized for you, the Palestinian Arabs say X about history and being the indigenous population versus the Jewish people that say Y, that they're the, that say the other thing, not Y, the question, but um, that, that say that they're the indigenous population. These things didn't happen in, in a public forum. I'm not even sure they happened at all until the 20th century. Right? It's the events of the late 19th and 20th century that ended up creating these whole debates in the first place. You, you, you don't see a lot in Islamic theology that I'm aware of or Islamic history questions that there was a Jewish people in the land of Israel for, you know, uh, at the time of biblical era or even the onset of, of Islam. These aren't, these aren't really arguments or questions. They only come on the world scene when there becomes now a, a political confrontation, right? And the political confrontation and the political controversy happened beginning in the late 19th century with the advent or the birth of two nationalist movements. One is the Arab nationalism, and these were offshoots of European nationalism, and the second, a Jewish nationalism, and the Jewish nationalism Got the, basically became known as Zionism. And it's around shortly after this time, uh, as the Jewish people started to, to migrate back to, to uh, Palestine, to Israel, that then you start to see some of the controversial back and forth start to appear. 
Okay, so I want to talk about these two major events, not so much the first one, mostly the second one, uh, that happened in the 20th century and how they then created the story, that the, the events, the current events that we're sitting in right now. Okay, and the two things I'm talking about are um, the, what I just mentioned, Jewish and Arab nationalism and World War I. Okay, just a, a, a very quick one-sentence background, because uh, I'm sure a lot of people here are already familiar with the story. There was a conference in Basel, Switzerland in 1897. Uh, a Jewish journalist named Theodore Herzl had managed to organize uh, an event that 200, approximately 200 delegates, Jewish delegates from around the world attended. And they basically came out of there with an aim to try and found a Jewish state in the land of, in Eretz Yisrael, ancient land of Israel, okay? Now Palestine, okay? Around the same time, shortly thereafter, there was also a political movement by the Arabs. It started in Lebanon, in the Arab intellectual circles. Uh, there was this um, emotional desire to try and create this pan-Arab entity. And these two uh, parallel nationalistic movements, political movements, were going to move side by side. Quite remarkable because there hadn't really been anything like either of these two things, although um, Jewish people had always been Zionistic. It had always been a longing for the land of Israel, to return to the land of Israel. But from a political po point of view, there really wasn't an opportunity. And all of a sudden, in the late um, 19th century, these opportunities start to present because of the world history. And all of a sudden now, you know, if either one of these things had happened 50 or 100 years before the other, we wouldn't be having a conversation today. But the way the events unfolded, they happened at the same time, and here we are. Okay, so... If it wasn't for World War I, which started in 1914, um, there's a likelihood that also these two nationalistic movements would not be any part of anybody's conversation uh, today. They might still be in the back rooms having their, their uh, meetings about what they're trying to accomplish, and maybe nothing would have ended up evolving. But again, you know, the uh, incredible... Uh, the way world history works, especially the fascinating part about, about this world history, is that, you know, it was the combination of these two political movements timing out at the same time as this great war, the First World War, that created an opportunity for both the Arab people and the Jewish people to realize some chance of having self-determination in lands that they, they wanted. All right, so this is a map of the Arab world in 1914, the, the various colors. So you can see that uh, much of it is under colonization by European powers. Okay, so France in the orange, Italian in pink, uh, Britain in purple, uh, mostly in a lot of places where oil interests were. And then the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, where this green color is, this horseshoe area. And what happens in World War I is that the Arabs now become an important population for the Allied powers, Britain, France, and Italy, against the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Turks. Had Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, opted to join the allied powers, we also likely wouldn't be having a conversation right now. But they chose the side that ended up losing the war. And what happened after that was lands then got divided. So you can see that the land of, the land of Israel, Palestine, is actually sitting right in one of the areas that is under control of the Ottoman Empire. And during World War I, there were a number of pledges that were made about the Ottoman territories by primarily Britain and France. Okay? And what were those pledges? So we're going to talk about um, two of them were pledges, and one of them was a secret negotiation. 
The first one, uh, the McMahon-Hussein correspondence, was a promise made to the Arab people. The second one was a negotiation, a secret negotiation between Britain and France. And the third one, something that I'm sure everybody's heard of here, the Balfour Declaration. So let's take a look at, at, at them. The two principal uh, characters involved in the correspondence were uh, a personality by the name of Hussein bin Ali, the sheriff of Mecca. This was the, uh, considered the most noble position in the Arab Islamic world. He uh, claimed direct descendancy from uh, the, Arab, the Islamic prophet Muhammad. And the British high commissioner in Egypt, Henry McMahon. So basically, I'm, I'm going to sum up what was a series of seven letters that went back and forth over the course of a number of months into one key uh, relevant point for our purposes today. And that is that um, probably the, the, the clearest correspondence that's maybe ever been written about, about this land and its borders was written by the Sheriff of Mecca to uh, McMahon about the territory that he wanted for a pan-Arab state. Remember I told you uh, just a minute ago, that in Beirut, a movement had started to try and unite the Arab people and have one big Arab state. Okay? And he wanted that Arab state. He, did, he described these borders from what you could see, what would be just north, like Syria, uh, the Mersenne Adana line, okay? down for what is now Iraq to the uh, um, Persian Gulf. And then the Indian Ocean, so the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the, the Sinai, and then up the coast of the Mediterranean. So that whole chunk of land is what he requested for the Arab state. And McMahon wrote him back a letter that basically said, we can give you pretty much everything you asked for, with the exception of this small strip of territory along the Mediterranean coast. So the sheriff of Mecca wrote back that he wasn't all too pleased about McMahon's delimitation, but he said they would discuss it further after, after the war. He felt that that area was also Arab. And so the question is, well, why did Britain need to even have that delimitation? What was the big deal to them? Now, one other thing to note that's important is that there was a question mark as to how far the delimitation actually went. There was, a, in, in the Ottoman Empire, their sub-districts were called vilayets. And how far down the vilayet of Beirut went was also, would also become a question later in terms of what land the British had left out of this promise and what land was promised and so on and so forth. So a couple of important things. Um, I'll talk about, first of all, the McMahon-Hussein correspondence and its status in international law, and second, the McMahon-Hussein correspondence according to how the Arab people view it, viewed it and still view it. In international law, the correspondence carries no weight. Right? At best, it's the pledge of one government to a people who wasn't a state and, and probably obligates Britain uh, they, made, they made a pledge, right? But in terms of the international community and international law, it doesn't have any standing in international law, right? There is, the international community didn't, didn't back this. This is just a, a, a promise made by, by Britain. The Arabs view this as the promise of their pan-Arab state, and they take it seriously, and they see a betrayal in Britain in having delimited that area and creating this separate entity called Palestine, okay? So as these letters were going back and forth between the Sheriff of Mecca and uh, the British High Commissioner, there was a secret negotiation going on called the Sykes-Picot Agreement between Britain and France. And what I want to speak to about this particular uh, agreement is that even though it doesn't look exactly like the states that are now in the Middle East, what you could see, if you look closely, is this carving up 
of the Middle East into these different zones, right? So in, if you look at the orangey type of area and the bluish areas, so there's a light and a dark in each of them. So the darker areas were areas that were going to be under direct control by the various governments of France and Britain respectively, the French up in the north and Britain down near the Persian Gulf. And then there were going to be zones of influence by each of them. And if you look, the area which was to become Palestine, Israel, was going to be this condominium, meaning a shared area internationally by the world. It was going to belong to nobody. And this is how the Britain and France had decided they were going to carve it up. Why? Because, you know, this part of the Mediterranean coast was always part important part of French history. And for Britain, this was important for oil interests. So they basically were carving up the land or spoke about carving up the land to serve what was their national interest. And while all this was going on, there was a third series of negotiations or conversations, which became known as the Balfour Declaration. Uh, this coming year is the 100th year, marks the 100th year anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. People have seen the news in the last couple of days that, uh, that uh, Abu Mazin, Mah Mahmoud Abbas, is speaking about suing the British government for... Uh, the Balfour Declaration. Okay, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, with this and has heard this before. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political and status enjoyed by Jews in other countries. So, for another lecture, maybe, um, we could pick this document apart for, what, for the language and what we're going to be, potential future controversies. For example, this phrase, national home, was never used before. Um, there was an issue. Uh, they felt that using the word state uh, might, be, might be problematic. And then, you know, the next uh, also other problematic thing was that there were going to be civil and religious rights for the non-Jewish communities in, in Palestine, but not political rights. Those political rights, speaking primarily of the Arabs, were going to be given to them in the rest of the Middle East. So you can already see things setting up for a p potential problem, right, down the road in terms of if the Arab people or their, this particular leader, Hussein, was requesting, you saw what he requested for their pan-Arab state, what he considered Arab, and that there was an Arab majority in that whole landmass. And then you've got now the European powers who are recognizing that the Jewish people should have a right to this territory, some kind of right. It's going to become a little bit more clear in a few minutes what, what that right was going to entail. Um, you could see it's setting up now for a potential, some potential problems, okay? So the Balfour Declaration um, also doesn't have huge standing in international law. It also was the promise of the British government to representatives of a people, the Zionist organization, and um, it's really one government's pledge. Now, what is going to give it a little bit more weight in international law is its provisions are going to be incorporated into a treaty uh, at, in, within, okay, this is in 1917, so two years approximately, a little about two years later, a year and a half later, it's the provisions of this, this letter are going to be incorporated into an international legal instrument. And so its provisions become imbued with legal status, but the actual Balfour Declaration itself doesn't carry much legal weight. Okay? And same thing, just like the Arabs viewed the McMahon-Hussein correspondence as a promise that they wanted honored, the Jewish people also viewed the Balfour Declaration as a promise that they wanted honored. So now you have these three different negotiations going on, and the water is getting a little bit muddied. Okay? Okay? 
So World War I ends, and the leaders of the various states, led by the United States, decide that you know, that war cannot happen again. Unfortunately, you, you know, we know all too well that another world war did happen shortly thereafter, just a couple of decades later. Um, but what they, what they hoped to do was prevent a tragedy of this kind of proportions from ever happening again in, in human history. They weren't successful, but that was their goal. So tens of thousands of people met in Paris. It basically became the world government and the world Supreme Court for this period in 1919. Now, just prior to the conference, representatives of the Arab and Jewish people, the Emir Faisal, who was the son of the Sheriff of Mecca, and Chaim Weitzman, who had kind of taken over the baton from Herzl as the leader of the Zionist organization representing Jewish interests, met and they forged an agreement. I'm just going to highlight some of the, some of the things because the language is quite remarkable. Um, many of you might have seen it before, but for those that haven't, I'm always marveled at you know, the phrasing of this agreement. If only today, you know, this communication could be in this kind of tone, right? Mindful of the racial kinship and ancient bonds existing between the Arabs and the Jewish people, and realizing that the surest means of working out the consummation of their national aspirations is through the cl closest possible collaboration the development of the Ar Arab state and Palestine. Right? Very cordial. The Arab state and Palestine, in all their relations and undertakings, shall be controlled by the most cordial goodwill and understanding, shall afford the fullest guarantees for carrying into effect the British government's declaration the 2nd of November, 1917. That would be the Balfour Declaration. Recognition is given to the right of large-scale Jewish immigration into Palestine. So What's important to understand from these negotiations is even though Faisal, we couldn't say that Faisal was speaking on behalf of all Arabs, right? Just like any of our leaders, prime ministers or presidents, don't speak on behalf of all of us. We, we have to abide by their decisions generally, but not all of us agree with the things that they say. Um, but there were six Arab chiefs when this whole process of Arab nationalism started that actually came to Faisal. And, and so you've got quite a mass of people that he is speaking for. He's just not speaking for everybody. So I just think it's important to understand that. He is representing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, but not necessarily the Arabs in Palestine. Okay? And it's obvious why, because they're not necessarily going to agree in all likelihood with some of his terms. But what, what we do know from this document is that there was no surprise, right, in the Arab world, right? There was full disclosure. This was quite public, this agreement, right? And these meetings were quite public. And so it's quite clear to a significant portion of the Arab leadership that there is going to be massive immigration, Jewish immigration into Palestine, and that the Balfour Declaration, the provisions of the Balfour Declaration are, it's expected that they're going to be forwarded, move forward, they're going to have a progression to them. So here are some three points that we can understand from the meetings between Faisal and Weizmann and their agreement. Because it said Arab state in Palestine, it, it, it's, cl it's clear from that wording that Palestine is not going to be an Arab state, right? There's going to be one, the, the goal is to have that one big pan-Arab state and that Palestine is not going to be included in that state. And the other thing is, is that the, pal the policies of the Balfour Declaration are going to be implemented with Faisal's support and, and the other Arab chiefs who were on board with him. Now remember, I said these meetings happened before the peace conference. So at the peace conference, what you have is basically a world government, a world supreme court called the Supreme Council of the Allied Powers, right? The victorious, the leaders of the victorious nations. And they're going to hold court. And in addition to trying to come up with some kind of 
penalty for Germany, which was obviously quite punitive and ended up leading to the Second World War. They're also going to settle uh, land issues and try and come up with some borders that allow people who otherwise should, who should have self-determination, who haven't up until this point in history, an opportunity to, to govern themselves, to control their own destiny. And a number of peoples show up at Paris and make petitions to the Supreme Council for land. The, Slo the Slovaks, uh, the Vietnamese, uh, in addition to the Arab and Jewish people. It's a world conference. It's not just Arabs and Jews that are making petitions for land. So on February 6, 1919, Faisal, representing the Arab de delegation, makes his petition to the Supreme Court. And you've already seen what they're going to ask for. They're going to ask for that chunk of that pan-Arab state, but with the delimitation for Palestine for the Jewish national home, because him and, him and Weizmann have already met and they've already come to an agreement. And on February 27th, three weeks later, Nahum Sokolov, representing the Zionist organization, makes his submissions. And the territory that he asks for is close to what people would recognize with those dashed lines you see are the borders today the territory today, those weren't there before. So they asked for territory roughly the equivalent of what would be uh, Israel and also the territories, plus territory, as you'll note, on the east side of the Jordan River. Why? Because, remember this map I showed you early on that I spoke about in terms of the Jewish historical narrative and what Jewish theology and Jewish history believes is was the land that was in possession of the, the Jewish people, the ancient, the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so this is the land that they requested. All right, so something important to understand in terms of the legal story. I mean, I told you, we're, we're looking at both how the different sides, the different claims of both sides, both from a historical point of view, from a legal point of view, and also from a political point of view. So the, the, the legal and political are kind of going hand in hand. But there's an important thing to understand that came out of the meetings in Paris that is uh, an important part of the puzzle. And that is the Covenant of the League of Nations, um, Article 22, which created this mandate system. And I'm going to read you just a little bit of this. To those colonies and territories, which as a consequence of the late war, have ceased to be under the sovereignty of the states which formerly governed them. Okay? Now, this includes Europe and the Middle East, right? There was a world war, and powers were defeated. And now there were people who had no government, who had no authority, right? And these places are inhabited by peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world. There should be applied the principle that the well-being and development of such peoples form a sacred trust of civilization. The world, what they said in, in uh, the League of Nations said in their covenant, the leaders of the world, the world powers, backed by the other 50 members, the 50-something members, of the League of Nations at the time said something has to be done to look after these people, right, who don't have a government, right, or else there's going to be chaos. And we believe that that should be a sacred trust of civilization. And what they said is that the tutelage of such peoples should be entrusted to advanced nations, people who knew how to build a country, right, as mandatories on behalf of the League. In other words, they were going to be trustee, trusteeships. Govern, there were, for certain world powers were going to handhold these peoples until they could self-govern. And it also said that in different territories, uh, the peoples were at different levels, uh, stages of their readiness to self-govern. Some could pretty much be ready almost immediately, and others it would take time. In, in addition to the creation of the mandate system, there were a number of treaties that came out of Paris like Trianon and Versailles, 
And the Treaty of Trianon basically busted up the Austrian-Hungarian -Hung Empire and created countries like Romania and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. These places never existed before. So people, these, these governments needed to, to now have an opportunity to form. There were different peoples there, but people, let's say prior to the war, who found themselves uh, Hungarian when the war started would now be Romanian at, after the war ended. And you can now understand why there's been some strife in Europe. Also, different peoples trying to make their claims for self-determination, self right? To try and right, I guess, the different borders that were created. The map of Europe basically changed, and the decisions made by the Allied powers, the Supreme Council of the Allied powers in Paris, became law. In other words, the countries abided by these decisions. It didn't always go perfectly, as I said. There were um, local conflicts, people striving for their own autonomy, but basically in terms of inter law, international law, the decisions made in Paris were recognized by the international community as law, and that's how things moved forward. Well, what about the former Ottoman Empire and their lands? So a year later, a year, what happened is the leaders in San Remo, it got long, and they had to go home. They, they were, uh, they were, away from their governing positions for months and months and, and they had to go back and they reconvened a year later in April of 1920 in this beautiful Italian Riviera town of San Remo. These powers, the Supreme Council of the Allied Powers, these leaders who met in Paris, some of them had changed, some of them were still the same. Some of them, there was a new, uh, new prime minister a new, uh, in France and, uh, but the British prime minister was still the same. Um, they met, they meet, they meet in this town and they basically decide what's going to happen now with the Ottoman territories. Europe had been decided in Paris and now they're going to create these mandates for the Middle East. And they created three of them. One called the mandate for Syria, another one called the mandate for Mesopotamia, Iraq, and the third one called the mandate for Palestine. So I want to talk about the mandate for Palestine because it had some unique elements to it. And remember I said to you that when the mandate system was created, it said that each one was going to have its unique properties. Okay? So the mandate for Palestine had unique properties. What were those unique properties? In the other two mandates, the mandate for Syria and the mandate for Iraq, the beneficiaries of that sacred trust, remember the sacred trust of civilization we spoke about? The beneficiaries of that sacred trust were the people that were living in those lands. The majority population, the Arab Muslim population that was living in those territories. The mandate for Palestine was unique. What was unique about it? The beneficiaries of that sacred trust were the Jewish people worldwide not just the Jewish people living in this area of Palestine at the time, right? Now, why is that? Why do, you, why do you think that was? Well, the answer is obvious if you think about numbers. First of all, there really was no point in creating this, these political rights for a people that was in a minority and had it been put to a vote, it would have been voted down the second it would have put it, been put in. Meaning, if there's 150 or 200,000 Arabs in the territory and 30 or 40,000 Jews, right, I'm just picking a number, right, would have been about a six to one ratio, right? Let's say 300,000 to 50,000 around, around this time, maybe a little bit more because there'd been some waves of Aliyah. But a roughly six to one ratio, and this was put to a vote, then if the Arabs had gotten political rights, the people like, within those boundaries had gotten political rights, then the, the whole experiment would have been a waste of time. We, we, everybody see that? The numbers just wouldn't make sense. Uh, all those in favor say aye, right? So the Jewish minority say aye. All those again say nay, and the Arab majority would have voted it down, and the whole thing would have been just an exercise in futility, right? But something more important than that, what was being recognized by the world at the time was the fact that this people who was making a claim that they had been dispersed for two millennia needed, it was, they were recognizing this people has a right to have an opportunity to, to go back should they choose. 
Now, at the time that they put this in place, I don't believe that anybody really knew whether the Jewish people were going to choose to go back to or not, but they had to give it a chance, right? It wasn't going to happen in five minutes. There were roughly 14 million Jewish people worldwide. There were, let's say, roughly 60, 70,000 at the time of the mandate, uh, somewhere around there, living in the Palestine borders at the time. And they needed to see whether Jewish people, if the opportunity was given to them, would go back. And so the beneficiaries of the Sacred Trust were the 14 million Jewish people worldwide. And, and the Arab argument on the other side is this is completely unjust and illegit. Like, we don't, we're not going to recognize, not only are we not going to recognize the Balfour Declaration, we are not going to recognize the mandate for Palestine and what was decided there. We consider it uh, a travesty of justice because the majority population there should have been, according to them, the beneficiaries of that sacred trust of the mandate. They're the ones that should have received the rights to self-determine in the area. They were the majority. But that's not what the spirit of the mandate for Palestine was. The spirit of the law was it was for 14 million people, Jewish people, living around the world. So the numbers are really 14 million, if you look at it in terms of the spirit of the law, to a few hundred thousand, not a few hundred thousand to 50,000. Does that make sense? Right? So, but according to, but if you look at it from the Arab position, that's their argument. Okay? So you understand, understand their positioning. Okay, so the mandate for Palestine basically also had echoed what the Bal like the uh, what you read in the Faisal Weizmann agreement that the provisions of the Balfour Declaration were going to, were now incorporated uh, into this international document, which is uh, recognized in international law. It's a treaty uh, which was ratified by 51 member states. In international law, a treaty is the strongest form of international law, and the more people that sign off on it, the stronger it is. And then it says, you know, it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which by prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. We spoke about that. And you could see where this was going to be problematic. Right? And it will come into play later. I'll just mention it now. We may not, I don't know that we're going to have time to deal with it today. Maybe it'll come up in a question and answer period. I'm just going to check our time because I want to leave time for you to ask, ask questions. But you could see that if Israel identifies itself as a democratic state, where this is going to be a challenge. Right? Every, everybody everybody see, see the potential problem with that, it, especially if there, there's not a Jewish majority. Right? How do you have a democracy if you don't have a majority? Okay? And it, then this last um, part of the preamble, which is much different than the Balfour Declaration, says, whereas recognition has thereby been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. Okay, so now we have incorporated into an international legal document the world basically saying that we recognize that the Jewish people today, meaning in 1920s, which be the equivalent of the Jewish people now, have a connection to these ancient Israelites that were there. And we believe that this people, should they choose, have an opportunity to reconstitute, to put back a situation that happened in world history that, through no choice of their own, ended up causing their dispersion for thousands of years. And if you look at that, in, through the lens of human history, it's um, unprecedented. And so if you look at that through a Jewish lens, it's unprecedented in a remarkable way. And if you look at it through an Arab lens, it's unprecedented in an absolutely ridiculous way. Right? Well, what, are you kidding me? I mean, these people are from don't speak a language, they don't look like us, 
right? They don't look like they're native to the area and claim that after 2,000 years that they should have a right to come back here. So from our perspective, it's the Jewish perspective, it's wow. And from an Arab perspective, it's like, you've got to be joking, right? We are not going to recognize that as legitimate at all, okay? Now, just so I can make a point here, that whatever the two sides happen to feel, right, doesn't matter in terms of the law, right? The law is the law. I mean, there are processes for changing the law if you don't like it, but what the Jewish people might feel or believe emotionally and what the Arab people might feel and believe emotionally is somewhat irrelevant, really, maybe not from a moral perspective in that conversation, but from a legal perspective, the law has made their decision, and this law, by the way, is still intact. This is the legal precedent for, for the territory from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. What the Israeli government decides to do with it is up to the Israeli government, but in terms of the precedents, and we'll talk a little bit about the gray areas in a second, but the mandate for Palestine, the provisions of the mandate for Palestine, and who really is sovereign in that territory from a political perspective, right? Those rights belong to the Jewish people according to the mandate for Palestine, which is still the legal precedent. And the Jewish people now really, not, not anybody in this room, but the government of Israel really speaks for the Jewish people now. Okay, so the law is the law. What people feel about it, I mean, people can have their different opinions, but, you know, that's, that's irrespective of, of what the status of the law is. Okay. So these, are the, this, this, uh, these pictures up here, which you also have in your handout, um, are pictures of land distributions for the... I want you to really focus not necessarily on all the mandates, but primarily the mandate for Palestine. The original one, as you can see... Uh, does not look like the shape of how people recognize the shape of Israel, including what is today called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip today. The map on the left is, is a much bigger territory. So what happened in 1921 and 1922 is the British government uh, amended the Palestine Mandate and created an article in, in the document which allowed them to take some liberties with the territory on the east side of the Jordan River. Why did they do that? When the French came in and took over the mandate for Syria, they kicked out Faisal, who was given that territory, and then his brother Abdullah, who was given Iraq, threatened to go to war, and the British government, uh, and really nobody really wanted to see another war, they'd all just come out of the First World War, and so they said, okay, just be patient and we'll figure out uh, a solution. And the solution they figured out was to lop off the territory. They, they added a, a, an article, number 25, into the, into the mandate, which said that they could take liberties with the eastern territory should they so choose. So they took the territory on the east side of the Jordan River and created Transjordan, which is now the state of Jordan. And this area that became Palestine was really the west, western portion of Palestine under the Palestine Mandate. Okay, so what happened during that Mandate era is also a whole history lesson in, in itself. But these are kind of the broad brush strokes. The Jewish people start making, they start immigrating in waves. Into, in, into Palestine, in the tens of thousands. And as there are these waves of immigration, aliyot, the Arab people each time get a little bit more anxious, right? The Arab people in Palestine, I'm, I'm speaking of, get a little bit more anxious because, and, and primarily, uh, you know, at first it's really the leadership, um, but also the local population because they see uh, their opportunities slipping away sometimes because land has been sold um, and they're in dire straits, they need the money, they sell off their land, and so they've, they've, they're, because they're having to change from a, a rural um, agricultural society to a more urban society, and there is frustration at what's going on. 
Okay? They also, you know, they also see these, these masses of Jewish people coming from European countries with far more skills in terms of, far more organization, far more skills in terms of building an infrastructure, and they feel like Britain is, is giving the Jewish people advantages that they don't have. And at the end of the day, what happens is there are Arab revolts, uh, usually violent, uh, against Jewish people, sometimes against the British, uh, and these happen in the 20s and the 30s. And eventually what happens is, the, is Britain, who now really is primarily just interested, uh, for the most part, in appeasing uh, an Arab population, which is much greater uh, in size in the region than the Jewish people are, and much more of a threat should they decide to get upset, uh, than they are about honoring their pledges and obligations in the Balfour Declaration. So they meet and they decide that the best solution to solve this problem is to partition the mandated area Palestine again. So again, meaning first time to create Transjordan. And then again to create another Arab entity uh, from the territory between now the Jordan River and the Mediterranean and a Jewish state. Okay, so an Arab state and a Jewish state. So this partition plan, which became known as the Peel Partition Plan, the orange area was going to be the area uh, allotted to the Jewish state. And the yellow area, the lightest yellow area, was going to be the area allotted for uh, the uh, Arab state of Palestine, or whatever it was to be called. And the red area in the middle, where you see where Jerusalem is, that was going to be an international zone, meaning owned by nobody. So if you're the Jewish people, you're now looking at the, the mandated area as having shrunk considerably to less than 10% of what was originally promised for the national home. If you're the Arab people in Palestine who feel that any Jewish entity, any place where the Jewish people have sovereignty over Arabs is not just. This is their view. Um, they weren't prepared to accept any such, end, any such place. Uh, they rejected the plan. The Jewish leaders did accept the plan. I'm sure not all too happy with the New Deal, but they accepted it, but the Arabs rejected it. The Arab leaders rejected it, again, for the reasons I, I just explained. So the Peel Partition Plan was gone. Fast forward now uh, 10 years. This is now after the Second World War. We all know what happened in, in the Second World War, uh, and uh, largely because of British policies uh, in terms of uh, their restrictions on immigration. Uh, one could say that I think a significant amount of, lo of lives that were lost in the Holocaust would have likely been saved had those people had an opportunity to go to Palestine. But they did not have that opportunity because uh, the British government put in a quota of just a few thousand uh, Jews allowed in. Um, and now was facing uh, not only hostility from uh, from not only were they coming out of, they had war fatigue coming out of Second World War and they were quite cash strapped, but they were also uh, facing uh, enormous hostility from both uh, Jewish and Arab militias and, and, and people in this area of Palestine. And they wanted help. I don't believe they really wanted to totally give up their control of the mandate, uh, but they, they went to the UN, the newly created United Nations, which was created in 1945, and said, we need some help. So the United Nations said, fine, we'll take it off your hands. Uh, and they, the, the United Nations sent a committee to Palestine to investigate, to decide what to do. Resolution 181 was a General Assembly resolution. General Assembly resolutions are not actually binding in international law. Security, Resol Security Council resolutions are binding. So Resolution 181 was a General Assembly resolution, meaning it wasn't binding on the parties. It was really just a deal that was put on the table for, an, for another partition plan, right? 
And this time, how they decided that they were going to break the territory up was the white area was the area proposed for the Jewish state, and the yellowy orangey area was the area was the area proposed for the Arab state. And then this little area in the, in the center here of the orange was going to be the area proposed as an international zone that was owned by nobody, but surrounded by, by, the, by the Arab state. Again, uh, the Jewish leadership, I, I believe, feeling some duress and also understanding that there were hundreds of thousands of persons in this place, persons camp, and needing to, to make a decision uh, accepted the partition resolution and the Arab states, again, feeling that any Jewish entity in this territory was not legitimate and that they were not prepared to recognize, um, turned, turned down the partition plan and walked away from the table. And then afterwards, afterwards what happened ended up triggering a civil, what became a civil war. Why? When the... Um, what was now the Jewish leadership in the community that's known as the Yishuv, pre-Israel, right, um, saw that the, there was not going to be any chance that the Arab states and the Arab leadership was ever going to accept a, a Jewish entity, took the initiative. Well, actually what happened was after the rejection of the, uh, of the uh, partition plan, Arab militias went to, went to attack Jewish settlements and then the response from the Jewish leadership was, and the Haganah, was to now try and go on the offensive and take control over the territory that was allotted to them according to this Security Council resolution. So there, in effect, became a civil war even prior to, not even prior, prior to the invasion of the Arab countries, okay? With the intent of Jewish forces trying to secure the area allotted to them and Arab forces particularly Palestinian Arab forces trying to prevent that from happening. And then in May, so this all happened starting after November when the, when the uh, partition plan happened, those different, that civil war started, hostility started. And then in May of 48, a few months later, when Britain packed up and left, they took their armed forces. Uh, the next day, uh, Israel declared their independence and then there was uh, an Arab invasion uh, of, the, of you know, the five Arab states atta attacked Israel. It ended in 49 with armistice agreements. And you could see uh, that the territory then held by what was now the Jewish state was greater than the territory allotted for them under the petition plan. Another, another thing that they, from the air perspective that they were upset about, but they had started the war. And this, this, again, one thing really important to remember, like whatever you hear about the events of 48, one overriding thing to understand about that time in history is that it was a war. <laughs> I mean, whatever you, you, you hear uh, stories from the Arab side about atrocities committed by Jewish forces, you hear stories from the Jewish side about atrocities committed by Arab forces, uh, civil wars are notoriously ugly. I mean, just look at the American Civil War. I, I mean, if you want, the French Civil War and so on and so forth. And this was a civil war, right? So at the end of the hostilities, the territory held by the Jewish state was different than the allotments and the partition plan. Egypt took over, a thi had a, this thin strip of territory, which has now become known as the Gaza Strip. And Jordan was now sitting in territory on the west side of the Jordan River, which now became known as the West Bank. Okay? Formerly Judea and Samaria, now the West Bank, because it's on territory on the west bank of the Jordan River. Okay? And even though there, there were um, hostilities in, in the 50s, this land, these, these land holdings remain kind of status quo until the 60s. Okay, in 67, um, there is what is the third... Arab-Israeli uh, war. I mean, the Sinai campaign in 56 really considered the second. So after 48, these are the territorial holdings. And then after 67, what happens is the Israel takes over control of that area that was called the West Bank. They take over the Gaza Strip. They take over the Sinai Peninsula, and they also take the Golan Heights. 
And this really is what leads us into the current events and the situation that we're in now. These um, territories that were captured in, situ in, in 67 put the Israeli government in a difficult situation. They did not feel that they could return to the pre-67 lines because at its narrowest point, the state of Israel was only nine miles wide. And they didn't feel that that was defensible considering their experience with their neighbors in the region. Right? They didn't feel that they could go forward with, with that and, and protect their, their country. And yet, they also didn't want to be in charge of a population, a significant population, hundreds of thousands of, of Arab people, who did not want to be governed by them. So they had a dilemma. I mean, what do you do when you, when you have a population that doesn't want to be governed by you, but you can't retreat back to lines that you feel are indefensible. So Israel proceeded on a security first policy. We need to hold on to the territory that will give us the best chance of survival. And then that created a problem with the international community. So Israel's security decisions were affected by a meeting that took place shortly after the 67 hostilities in Khartoum when the Arab states met and basically decided that they would not recognize the Jewish state and they would not negotiate with it. And so it left Israel in a bind now from a security perspective. How do we move forward? Well, the international community took their own initiatives and this actually is a Security Council resolution, meaning according to international law, was binding on the parties. And this is the first time that you actually hear uh, with regard to the territory of Palestine or Israel, this word occupied being used. And what it said was, and, and you have, I think also, I might have put that in, in your handout as well, um, that Israel was expected to withdraw from territories they've occupied as a result of the 67 war, but that they are also entitled to recognition of secure boundaries and a right to live in peace. So how do the two sides view this resolution? Well, the Arabs take the position that when Israel withdraws from all the territories that they captured in 67, we will talk about recognizing secure boundaries and their right to live in peace. Israel says, I don't think so. When you recognize our right to have a state, a Jewish state, you recognize boundaries of that state and you recognize our right to live in peace, then we will have a negotiation about withdrawal from whichever territories right, allow us to move forward. And this has kind of been the stalemate since 1967, right? And these are the positions of almost every peace initiative has moved forward on the idea of these pre-67 lines for a solution to this Arab-Israeli conflict. So that when you hear the Obama administration talk about pre-67 lines based on Resolution 242, withdrawal from occupied territories, and so on and so forth. This is the, the source of that position and that policy. So in the 70s, uh, there is another war, right? The 73 war, which ends up being a bit of a game changer because Israel is caught by surprise and still manages to survive. And the Arab states at that point in time decide, I don't think we're going to beat these guys in a military confrontation. We need to change our strategy. And the strategy change now became one of propaganda. And, um, and now they decided to, oh, first there was an oil, they used oil as a weapon. They turned the taps off, which 
changed foreign policy of a lot of the Western industrialized nations who depended on Arab oil from a either neutral or pro-Israel position to a not so neutral and not so pro-Israel position. Like Japan, for example, had completely reversed. They were almost entirely dependent on Arab oil. Um, and then the Arab, the Arab League made another move. Uh, an organization called Fatah, who I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, it's a, an acronym for a Palestine, the Palestine Liberation Movement headed by Yasser Arafat. Then became recognized as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Up until this time, the Arab states weren't prepared to give Arafat any power, right? Jordan actually f tried and found they had a number of different uh, difficult confrontations with Arafat and the PLO. Um, but at this meeting, they decided that this was a strategy that they could be effective with in the international arena. And very soon after that, resolutions in the United Nations started to go from resolution 242, one could argue is somewhat ambiguously fair, right? And the resolutions start being quite unambiguous and quite one-sided. For example, in 1975, before this resolution is the infamous Zionist, Zionism is racism resolution passed at the UN, um, basically aligning it or saying it is, it is in cahoots with South African apartheid, that it's racist. I mean, that resolution was later rescinded, but the damage was already done. Um, all of these things start to appear because the Arabs as a, as a block of nations have a lot of power at the UN, right? Uh, they carry a lot of weight because of their, uh, their oil um, assets. And then, you know, what, what started to happen is Israeli settlements, the first settlements that, that Israel built were in the Gush Etzion area, which were attacked viciously during the uh, hostilities in the 48 war. And so they went to rebuild those communities. And then as settlements, those settlements got built, the UN then passed a resolution which said the, that the settlements have no legal valid validity and that they're obstruction to peace. And this is something you hear quite often, that the reason why the Arab-Israeli conflict continues is because the Israeli government continues to build settlements in the West Bank. So just a quick uh, point to that, um, Israel's argument in regards to, 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 to that claim was probably best summed up by Golda Meir said, you know, if settlements are the problem, then why did 67, then 67 shouldn't have happened. You know, how do you explain 67? In 67, uh, there were, it wasn't a single Jewish settlement in, in the West Bank, and yet the Arab state still uh, went to war against Israel. What is it that was the prevention of peace at that time, right? There were no settlements. So how can you then say now that settlements are what's causing the roadblock today? In July of 1980, the Knesset uh, passed legislation to annex uh, the eastern neighborhoods and to unify Jerusalem. And then the UN followed by basically claiming that those measures were a violation of international law. And following on that in the 90s, I um, appreciate your, con your, your concentration, we're, we're almost done. In the 90s, there was, a, beginning with Oslo, there was a series of peace initiatives, which basically were um, all set around the principle of trying to trade land for peace. It had worked in the first part. If only Israel were to withdraw from the West Bank, so that a Palestinian state could be created, then we could move past all these hostilities and all these negative feelings um, and move forward. So in trying to move forward with a land for peace idea, Israel uh, decided to take a look at the West Bank and come up with a graduated plan. So they divided it into different areas. Area A is the areas of the West Bank that had 90% of the Arab population uh, lived in those brown, brownish areas. Israel said, okay, so what, what we'll do this is first, 
We will withdraw from Area A and turn that over to the Palestinian Authority. You'll have exclusive control in that area. And then we'll see how that goes. And then Area B, we will have a joint security control. Both are like the joint police those areas. And Area C will remain under Israeli control. Why? Because the hills overlooking Tel Aviv and the entire coast of Israel for security reasons were exposed to those areas and Israel felt like they needed to maintain a security force there. And same with the, the uh, border with Jordan and the rest of the Arab world. After what happened in Gaza, Israel felt like if they leave that border unattended, it will just be an opportunity for missiles to flow in and they'll end up with a Gaza Strip sitting in the higher area of the Central Hill region, which they obviously were not open to given the history of the relationship with the Palestinian Authority and the Arab region at large. Um, but they, so the... Uh, the Oslo plan did move forward. I mean, today the West Bank is divided into these areas. And, it, and if you actually travel in Israel and you see the various checkpoints, you'll see that Area A is uh, by law off limits to any Israeli to, to enter into, into that area. Um, and this is kind of where we're at today. This, uh, this, the, um, these areas are separated by checkpoints so that movement can be controlled and this is where you end up with the accusations against Israel from movements like BDS and so on and so, so forth that Israel abuses human rights like, like the mobility rights and so on and so forth of the Arab people in the West Bank. Um, you know, what was a, a plan to try and find a staged way to move forward has ended up turning into a... Uh, unfortunate uh, propaganda situation that doesn't work in, in Israel's favor.